My name's Till White and I'm a clinical psychologist at the Institute of Psychiatry at King's College London. And I'm going to talk to you today about a new therapy called a cognitive remediation for people with schizophrenia. Now, schizophrenia is a disorder that afflicts about 1% of the population and associated with it is positive symptoms, hallucinations and delusions and negative symptoms such as a lack of motivation. But also, one of the most pervasive problems that people with schizophrenia have is difficulties with cognition. These difficulties appear way before the positive symptoms um, appear and are really important in determining people's outcome. For instance, if you look at Michael, he's a, a person who appeared very bravely on a UK TV programme talking about his cognitive problems. He thought he was going to get poor grades in his exams, and he did. He thought um, he had problems with memory and his concentration, and also showing a lot of insight. He says he's coming to terms with having a learning disability. Now, people with schizophrenia um, have difficulties with cognition, and their cognition affects their recovery. But it's not just that it just predicts their recovery without any treatment. Even when we provide high-quality treatments, People with schizophrenia still um, have uh, limits to their benefit because of their cognitive problems. And what's not surprising, therefore, is that their cognitive difficulties are also related to the costs of their care. So in this slide, you can see a very complicated diagram. Uh, it's a model by a health economist called Anita Patel from the Institute of Psychiatry. And she's shown in this diagram that only cognition, not symptoms, actually predicts the costs of care. Now, one of the issues, because it's a patient-valued outcome that improvements in cognition, and that cognition is related to things like supported employment outcomes or social relationships, um, patients value them, and so do, of course, the healthcare providers because of its influence as well on the costs of care. So cognition has now become a, a treatment target in its own right. And what's happened over the previous few years is the development of a new therapy called cognitive remediation. This is a psychological treatment. And uh, although there are cognitively enhancing drugs that are currently in the experimental phase, in fact, none of these, these drugs have actually shown uh, definitive benefit um, at the current time. So what is cognitive remediation? Well, it's a behavioural-based training therapy which has the specific aim, of course, of increasing uh, and improving cognition in people with schizophrenia. But it also has another aim, and that's to have durable benefit on community functioning. And it's made up of a number of key elements which we know are important for um, therapies in general in terms of learning, but it, for people with schizophrenia in particular. So we've got errorless learning, which is where we try and reduce the number of opportunities for um, making errors. This is important because it, we then make sure that people actually learn the skills correctly. And most therapies actually have a, an 80% performance correct criterion, um, even when they're moving between lower level tasks and more complicated tasks. The next component is self-monitoring. And this is where either people learn to uh, talk themselves through um, a particular uh, task or else they, um, the, the computer program itself actually provides hints on how to do the task. Now, we know that this is important for um, complex tasks, but some evidence recently has shown that it might be a problem when we, uh, in terms of impeding learning on more basic tasks. So perhaps we should only use it for those language-dependent uh, cognitive operations or more complex, complex tasks. The next component is scaffolding. Scaffolding is where you uh, put pressure on the learning system. All the basic elements are learnt, but you're increasing the complexity of the task. Um, always within the competence of the individual, but you still need to provide um, some learning support for the scaffolding. Now, human and uh, human studies have shown that when there is compromised neural plasticity, then uh, you can actually improve plasticity by reducing the time between the uh, learning 
um, trials and the recalled trials. Now, this has clear implications for people for um, the cognitive remediation studies. In particular, we know that we perhaps need to provide more intensive um, sessions. So most uh, cognitive remediation therapies actually provide uh, probably th between three and six hours of training per week in order to have these intensive therapies. Those four are components are the things which most of the, of the um, cognitive remediation therapies have. But this one, the strategies versus practice alone, is one that where only some but not all of the training programs have it. Strategies are where you teach explicitly um, how to carry out a task. And we know that for some learning elements, this is quite important. We also know from human studies and from computational neuroscience that it's important to provide opportunities for learning strategies in different kinds of task contexts. So for computer learning and for learning mathematics, these sorts of strategies or representations are important. So does cognitive remediation work? Well, one of the ways of testing this is to look at all the studies um, and add them together to see if there is a consistent effect across the different studies. And last year we did just this and we, added, we had a look at 40 studies with nearly 2,000 participants and looked at the effects. And what we found was, on the left-hand side of this slide, you can see that there is a significant effect at the end of therapy of cognition, functioning and of symptoms. But you might remember that one of the big issues that we had was that there needed to be durable improvements. And as now you can see in pink, there are uh, effects, in fact, significant effects at the end, uh, at follow-up in cognition and in functioning, but the effects on symptoms, which were small anyway, have now disappeared. And many of the differences uh, between the therapies actually had no effect on whether there was an improvement in cognition. However, there was one thing which seemed to have an effect um, on the functional outcomes, and this was where the strategies were provided within the therapy. So there was a significant effect on functioning if the strategies were provided, but not if they were just practice alone. And what we also found was if you provide strategies in the context of another remediation program, you double the effects on functioning. And that's really important if we're going to try and improve functioning outcomes. Now, I want to explain how um, functioning works. And on the right-hand side of the screen now is a study by Susan McGurk. She uh, actually entered people into the study if they had failed to get a job at the end of supported employment. And she gave them supported employment again, alone, or with cognitive remediation. And the cognitive remediation is the upper line here. You can see that in the purple, you get more effects on uh, supported employment. So people are more likely to get a job, more likely to earn more money, um, and more likely to stay in that job than were people who just received the supported employment alone. So cognitive remediation does have an effect um, on functional outcomes. But it also has some effects on the brain. And on the left-hand side, you can see in patients who are uh, mostly chronic um, that there's an increased activation of the brain towards more healthy functioning following cognitive remediation. But perhaps most interestingly is the effects on people who have a first episode of psychosis. And here on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see the uh, effects over a two-year period of cognitive remediation in people in the early stages of their psychosis. And if you can see the uh, dotted lines of the people with cognitive remediation and uh, the people with the, without the dotted lines are the people in the control group. So the control group over two years see a deterioration, so a reduction in the grey matter, whereas people who received cognitive remediation have a preservation of that grey matter and may even actually increase grey matter. Now, so there are effects on the brain and we know that cognitive remediation works. But in addition to that, there are an awful lot of scientific questions which we really don't know the answers to yet. For instance, in this model, um, it shows possible moderators and mediators of the effect. For instance, age might affect the relationship between cognition and outcome. And therapy could have an effect just on 
cognition, but that seems highly unlikely. It could have an effect on functioning, could have effect on the relationship between, function, between cognition and functioning, or it could have an effect on any of the other possible mediators and moderators. And these are scientific questions which we really don't know the answer to. And in a recent study looking at the direct effects of therapy on cognition and then on functioning, we only accounted for about 15% of the variance. So there's a whopping 85% that we don't know anything about and we need to unpack if we are to improve therapies for people with schizophrenia. Now, um, we know that cognitive remediation works, but we also know that we really need to tie thinking skills to everyday life. So in the second wave of therapies, uh, we're trying to do this tying together of thinking skills and, metacog and metacognition, which is um, a way of thinking about how you should use your, your thinking skills in everyday life. And people like Alice Medalia in New York are pioneering things called bridging groups, where you actually talk to people about how the cognitive remediation has improved your cognitive skills and then try and get people to bridge the gap between those thinking skills and everyday life. What we've done in, in my team is to develop a computer program which does the same thing actually within the therapy itself. So we have, uh, ex we have abstract tasks which teach the basic cognitive skills and then we have exercises where those cognitive skills are used. So we're building in metacognition and uh, transfer or generalization to everyday skills within the therapy. We're also, and I think this is what most of the people are now doing with cognitive remediation, is to actually ask people what their personal goals are for therapy. This not only makes cognitive remediation relevant, but it also makes people more engaged within the therapy, which is, of course, very important. So what, we've, what have we learned about cognitive remediation? Well, cognitive remediation does work. It improves cognition, functioning, and, um, and has durable benefits. We also know in these second wave of therapies that we're going to try and link more closely the cognitive skills with everyday activity. And uh, probably what's going to be really interesting and exciting is that in the near future, we might even have cognitively enhancing drugs which will release some more neural plasticity which cognitive remediation can make use of. And then we'll get better tailored therapy and better effects on recovery outcomes for all our patients.